Good evening, everybody. How are y'all doing this evening? We are glad that you've joined us at First Baptist Church here in Rockport. I'm Marcy Peterson. We've got Becky here on the piano. And uh, we are going to, uh, to begin our service this evening with singing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. But before we start, I just want to share 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 4 with you. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to the world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, then they do not listen to us. That's how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. So, dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Would you join me in singing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, Jesus, Lord and Savior. 
Jesus who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live, O oh Christ, for Thee alone. Living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of His smile, seeking Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life give henceforth to live, O oh Christ, for Thee alone. Good evening, everybody. So glad to be able to spend this Wednesday night with you and that you've chosen to spend this time with us. It's my prayer that you are well can say that we all miss you here, looking forward to being with you all again, and I hope that you're taking care of yourself and your families and that you haven't gone quarantine crazy yet anyway. I can tell you that there's a lot of talk about opening up the country and then opening up Rockport and Aransas County, and I've been talking to other leaders in our, in our community, and we're trying to follow guidelines from the White House and the governor of the state of Texas in order to make sure that we're doing everything that we need to do to keep people safe. And so there are, we're making plans, trying to figure out a way to open up our community again. But I can tell you that you should expect a slow process. And we're going to do what we can to bring people together, but to do it in a ways that make sense and that are safe. Uh, that are sensible and safe because we, we, we care about everybody. We don't want anybody to get sick, and we certainly don't want cases to spike so that we end up back in quarantine again. Anyway, we'll be talking more about all of that in the next week or so. Uh, the staff here at First Baptist Church have started working on a plan, a three-phase plan to reopen the church in the coming weeks, and we'll just see how the Lord leads us and how the Lord provides. We're going to continue tonight our study in the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to be in Jeremiah chapter 1. And uh, we've returned to the study because it's meant something to me to relook at some of the things that I love about the book of Jeremiah and uh, Eugene Peterson's study on Jeremiah that he did that spoke to my life. And so I'm using some of that as well. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 1. Last week we talked about how I have to remember that there are things about myself that can only be defined or learned from God. I am not on some quest of self-discovery as much as I'm on a quest of God-discovery. 
I'm tempted to define myself according to other realities than the one that is the truth. Often what I see and perceive is not the truth. Therefore, I must allow God to open my eyes, to correct my vision, so that I can see His perspective on my life and my circumstances. If you look in Jeremiah chapter 1, at verse 5, we looked at this some last week, but God tells Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. See, God had extraordinary plans for Jeremiah. He wanted him to be a prophet. And last week I told you how a prophet lived by two convictions. One, that God is personal, alive, and active in my life. Therefore, I must come to know God intimately. He is present, He is active, and everything depends on me coming to know the Lord, to drawing close to the Lord. The second conviction in the life of the prophet is that what God is doing right here, right now, is critical. This is not a lag time in the plan of God. This is a critical moment in God's plan. And so I must pay attention to what God is doing right here, right now. And I should also participate in what I see God doing. It's as if God is telling Jeremiah, you have been chosen to walk with me and to know me in special ways and then you are to let my people know what I'm doing so that they can know me and participate in the advancement of my plans and purposes. So look now at chapter 1 verse 6. Jeremiah responds to what God has been saying to him. He says, Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a child. It's interesting that after God lays out this this plan for Jeremiah, Jeremiah responds in this way. He did not want the job of a prophet. Why did Jeremiah decline? to be involved with what God was doing. His reasoning is, in verse 6, that he was not qualified. He says, I'm just a child, a youth. He says, I'm too young, too inexperienced, and I don't know how to speak. And I think, like Jeremiah, we are all experts at pleading our inadequacy to God. How often do we find ourselves telling God that we are not capable of living how He calls us to live? There are all kinds of reasons about why we can't, whatever, you finish that sentence. But we are pros at making excuses or providing reasons about why we are inadequate to the calling God has placed on our lives. I encounter many people who feel they will not be able to face the things that are in front of them, especially now during the quarantine and then trying to figure out how to re-enter life the way that we knew it. There's a lot of people who are feeling overwhelmed and they wish it would all just go away and they don't feel at any given moment like they're up to the task that God has placed in front of them. It's too much. I can't do it. God is asking too much of me. And I think it's okay to be honest and to say those kinds of things because it's true, isn't it? I mean... On my own, left to my own devices, I am not capable of living the life that God has called me to live. I am inadequate. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not resourceful enough. Left to myself, I'm not able to face what's in front of me. Now look at verse 7 as God responds to Jeremiah. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms 
to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah felt like he was not qualified to serve the way that God was calling him to serve. What was God's opinion? God told him, you are qualified to do this because I made it so. All you need to know is that I'm with you. I am with you. There is an enormous gap between what we think we can do and what God calls us to do. Our ideas of what we can do or what we want to do are often too small and too trivial. God's ideas for us are grand and beyond us. And God assured Jeremiah, I'm with you. And I've put my words in your mouth. Everything's going to be okay. Because it depends on me, Jeremiah, not on you. Now look down at verse 17. God is speaking to Jeremiah and he says, Get yourself ready. Stand up to say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you, and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah feels like he's a child who does not know how to speak. God tells him, no, Jeremiah, what I see when I look at you, I see that you are a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall, who has all of my authority to build, to tear down, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have these two very different ideas about who Jeremiah is and what he would be able to accomplish. You have God's vision, and then you have Jeremiah's vision. So which one was right? Jeremiah wasn't like what God wanted him to be right away, and it didn't happen all at once, but God spoke as if it was as good as done. And eventually it did happen because Jeremiah allowed it to happen. There comes a point where I may be able to thwart God's plan in my own life if I refuse to let him have his way with me. If I insist on my reality, then that may be what God allows for me to experience what I define reality to be. I could also choose to trust God and accept Him at His word and allow Him to accomplish through me what He wants. And that's a very different reality than often the one I have in mind for myself. How did Jeremiah make that transition? How did he move away from his inadequate concepts of himself and embrace God's reality that he could not see? That's a complicated answer. But it has to do at least with these two visions that God gives him here in the first cha chapter. And I think that we also need to understand what God says to Jeremiah and then embrace these things in our own life. And so what are the two things that God gives to Jeremiah, this picture that he paints for Jeremiah that helps to define reality for the prophet two visions here's the first one it's the vision of the almond tree and it's a reminder of God's character look back in verse 11 of chapter 1 the word of the Lord came to me what do you see Jeremiah I see the branch of an almond tree I replied and the Lord said to me you have seen correctly for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. So, when it comes to the almond tree, this is a powerful image. There's, an, there's a visual thing for Jeremiah to latch onto, and there's also an auditory clue for Jeremiah to hear and to make sense of. The visual image is one of almond trees blooming. Almond trees are often the first trees to bloom in that part of the world. At the, end of enter, at the end of winter, it's a sign that spring is coming. 
it's cold and it still feels like winter, but the blooms on the almond tree is a sign that although it doesn't look like it, spring is on its way and it will arrive at just the right time. The auditory clue for Jeremiah to hear and to understand is the play on words in Hebrew between the word almond and the word watching. They're almost identical. In Hebrew, the word for almond is shakhed. And the word for watching is shoked. And so God asked Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see a shakhed. And God says, nah, well I am shoked. I am watching. And what it means is that God will watch over His Word to make sure that it comes to pass. You can know that what God says is certain and never doubt it. What God promises is true. What He calls you to, He is faithful to make happen. And He will always do what He says. So God called Jeremiah to know Him in very deep and real ways, to proclaim a time of judgment, and then promise a time of renewal and restoration and grace. It's like in the late winter, Jeremiah would see the almond trees in bloom and remember that God watches over His Word in order to bring them to pass. What God says will happen. And then, Whenever Jeremiah listened to parents describing how they watch over their children, he would remember God's promise to himself that God is watching over his word. He will bring it to pass. At a deep level, we need to be convinced of these realities and reminded of them often. Otherwise, we will get so caught up in the mundane routines of life that we will miss the signs of God's presence We will miss the evidence of the kingdom in our midst. He promised, God promised to be here with us, that we would receive power through the Holy Spirit, that we would bear fruit of the Spirit, fruit for His kingdom, fruit that would last. And He is here watching over His Word in our lives. Are we watching for Him? We must learn how to see the signs of God's presence in our lives, like the almond tree in bloom. Jesus told Nicodemus that the Spirit moves the way the wind blows. You don't always see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. Are we able to perceive the way that God's Spirit moves in our lives and in the times in which we live? He told us to look for signs of His coming, He told us that the world would know that He is present among us when those who believed in Him love one another the way that Christ loves us. And I wonder, are we looking for the supernatural realities that are all around us? God keeps His Word. The kingdom is present in our midst. God is active in our times, even during the quarantine And God is doing all that He has promised to us. That means, perhaps, that I make a response to God by not quitting, by not giving up. I learn to see the signs and to trust Him each day. I I know that it feels like winter right now, but the almond blossoms promise that spring is near. And so I keep going certain of what is to come, but maybe hasn't happened yet. The other vision that is so powerful in shaping the way the prophet Jeremiah was to perceive reality was the vision of the boiling pot. And the boiling pot is a reminder that God, that what God is doing right now is critical. And we need to pay attention so that we'll know what He is doing. Look in chapter 1 at verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north, I answered. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. 
They will come against all her surrounding walls, against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshiping what their hands have made. Here, the image is of this pot, this boiling pot that God is about to pour out on the land. And there's no secret in Jeremiah's time that there were invading armies to the north and that, the, the, that Jerusalem itself would be in danger. Uh, everybody, I think, who was paying attention to reality understood those things. But Jeremiah needed to help the people of Jerusalem connect the dots so that they could see the hand of God at work in their time. The imminent war with Babylon is linked to God's judgment. The war with Babylon was not some random event of socioeconomic or geopolitical conflict. The people had abandoned a relationship of love with God, the God who had entered into this covenant with them. And God's plan was to get their attention, to discipline them, to bring them back into a right relationship. God's plan was redemption, restoration, and a display of His wonderful grace, mercy, and glory for all to see. But that plan was going to play itself out over the span of decades and across all of the geo geopolitical realities of the Middle East at that time. First, God would show His glory to the world by dealing with His rebellious, hard-hearted people and their sin. The people who had turned their backs on Him and had chosen idols instead of the God who chose them. And so, as a result of what God was doing, evil and suffering was about to fill the land. But it wasn't going to be an unlimited river of evil. It was going to be only the amount of evil that could be contained like in a cauldron. God controlled all that was about to happen. Evil and suffering have limits according to God's design. The boiling water flowing through the land was supposed to be cleansing. The suffering would serve God's purposes, causing the people to repent and allowing them to return to a right relationship with God and experience the blessings of that right relationship. They needed to allow God the time to complete what He was going to begin. And He gives them, over time, promises to sustain them along the way. For instance, Jeremiah 29, 11, which we all love, that says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And what he wanted his people to understand that, yes, it was going to be tough, but evil and suffering are not everywhere, and it's not everything. It's not final. God is final, and God is in control. And the truth is, God's not finished yet. And I think even in our day, just like in Jeremiah's time, there is this battle being waged against God and His kingdom. It plays itself out in the lives of billions of people every moment of every day, everywhere on the earth. Each life is a battleground. And what God is doing right now in my life and in your life is vitally, vitally important, not just to you and me, but to God Himself. It's important to Him. My life doesn't seem very epic. So what's so important about the way I'm living right here in the midst of this quarantine? I know a lot of people sense that their security is being threatened. That there are people who are living with anxiety and fear. There is much grief over a variety of losses that people are feeling in their lives right now. It's a challenge for people to live out the loving servant example of Jesus Christ when they feel so isolated, so uneasy, and frankly, so depleted from one day to the next. 
We grow uncomfortable with the work God is doing in our lives because He's touching us in areas that we would prefer that were untouchable. We don't want God uh, messing around in certain parts of our lives, touching our security, our sense of control. We get indignant. We get angry. We get uh, grief-ridden over how little control we actually have over our realities and the people that are in our orbits. We want all of this to be over. We just want to feel better again. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And in John 16, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Peace, or shalom, is something that is only experienced in the presence of God. And that is exactly what Jesus promises to all of those who trust in Him. I think that my effectiveness in communicating the peace of God described by Jesus will depend on the depths of God I have personally explored. Jeremiah would be able to speak to the issues of pain and suffering and unfairness, sin and redemption with great authenticity because of how he wrestled with God over these very things in his own experience. He struggles, and we'll see this throughout the book of Jeremiah. He struggles with God, and yet he kept going in his faith and being obedient to God. And my message to this world of repentance and renewal, my message of peace and persistence, may only be as genuine as my own brokenness and desperation for God. My message of hope may only sound as authentic as my testimony of faithfulness will allow. Jeremiah was called to live out this great message of hope, redemption, and renewal in the midst of a dark, painful, and apparently hopeless time. He could stand like an iron pillar and bronze wall because he knew God, because he experienced God's presence in his life. He trusted in God's word. That is the only way that we will be able to stand amidst the pain and the chaos of our times and in the lives of people and speak messages of hope, renewal, and restoration with a voice that sounds real and authentic. These two visions burned themselves into Jeremiah's mind and allowed him to keep faith, to keep his sanity, to keep his passion for God as he walked with God through troubled times as God accomplished his purposes on this grand stage of human history over the course of decades. We also must allow these two visions that God gave to Jeremiah to transform us as well. Here's the truth, though. I am prone to underestimate God and to overestimate evil. I am prone to not see what God is doing around me and therefore to conclude that God is doing nothing. I am prone to see everything evil in the world and think that evil is winning, that it's dominant. I am prone to think too little of God and assume He would be better off using someone else other than me. I am prone to think that God is working to accomplish my comfort, my security, my happiness instead of accomplishing His glorious plans. What's more, if I were honest, When I think God is working to accomplish my comfort, my security, and my happiness, I'm also prone to think that He's failing. He's not doing a very good job of making me secure, happy, and all of those things. And I'm prone to see my life as being uncomfortable, insecure, and I feel just scared. The visions that God gave to Jeremiah 
penetrate or slice through my false perceptions of the appearance of reality. And they reveal the truth, God's truth, that lies underneath, that's there if I just can see it correctly. God would have me learn to trust in His Word, to trust in what I cannot see. And God would have me live in this world, in these times, paying attention to every detail, knowing that in all things, God is moving us toward completion. It's my prayer for you that you would remember that God is present. He's watching over His Word. He's going to keep His promises. He will finish what He has started. And that you and I have a role to play in whatever it is that He's accomplishing. Lord, open my eyes so that I may see. It's my prayer that the Lord would open your eyes in the midst of your quarantine. Let's pray together. Lord, we pause right now to ask God, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, increase our capacity to understand and trust in your word. Help us to remember that you are with us, watching over your word. You will accomplish what you've promised. And help us, Lord, to understand that what you're doing in our lives and in our time is important. It's vitally important to you and it should be to us as well. Help me to understand my times correctly so that I'm not in despair or overwhelmed or hopeless. Instead, Lord, help me to see from your perspective and give me the courage to take you at your word, to have hope, and to actually obey and engage with what you are doing in the world around me. I pray, Father, that you would lift the spirits of those who are watching, that you would remind them of how near you are to them. I pray that you would keep them safe. It's our prayer that you would give wisdom and discernment to our leaders as they move us forward on the path you've placed us. I pray, Lord, that you would bring us together so that we could resume life as you see fit and keep one another safe at the same time. Show us how to go forward. Pray, Lord, that you would protect those who are on the front line. May you keep them safe. We turn our eyes to you. We trust you. May your will be done. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and good night. Thank you.